So a um, long time ago, the topic was chosen for today, and my husband said, I'm going to be gone, and I'd like you to preach on this topic. And the topic is stress. And I said, sure, babe, I'd love to preach that message for you. Well, you know we can all identify with the topic, but unfortunately, usually when you preach a sermon on the topic, you live it. So I was like, thank you, I'd be happy to preach this message. But I gotta tell you, what's been really awesome is that as I've been walking out preparing for the message, the Lord has literally been gifting me with supernatural peace. And so I just give God praise for that. Just God, give God praise. Um, now, we, we've been talking last week. If you did not hear the message last week, my husband, Pastor Rob, he challenged us to not just be a fan of Jesus, but to be a follower. And if you did not catch that message, you want to go back and to watch that message. But we as believers, as followers of Jesus, we are striving to be a follower, but let's be real, we live in a broken world that pushes and pressures and just influences how we think and feel as we live our daily lives. So our goal today is to gain some insights from God's word that we can use to be a Jesus follower everywhere we go. So let's, let's pray. We just, we, I know we spend a lot of time in prayer and worship, but I want you just to kind of begin to open your heart and open your mind just a little bit more. Would you mind just putting your hands out in a posture of receiving? And I just want to pray that the Lord will open us to hear his word. Lord, I thank you that your word is real and living and active. We are here because we want to hear from you. So we pray in agreement that you will come. And as you draw us to you, Lord, you might whisper to some of us and you might be shouting to others of us today. But God, you're calling us to come to you, whether we're weary or whether we're fearing strong, and that we might be able to find your guidelines, Lord, from your word, that we might leave the stronghold of stress behind and walk forward in courage. And we receive this, we open our hearts to this. In your name we pray, amen. Well, a couple of weeks ago, I had the privilege of being at Prayer Works with some of our teenagers who were leading worship down at the Prayer Works. If you've not been there, you need to take a trip down there. It's by Electric Works. But just the presence of God is so sweet. And while I was there, um, the Lord drew me to Matthew chapter 14, and he made it extremely clear that this is the passage that he wants us to sit in this morning so we can learn about what he has to say about stress. So go ahead and open your Bibles. I'm gonna set up the passage for you, but go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 14. Now in this passage, Jesus and his disciples, they've just been out on a massive open field. And Jesus took some bread and some fish that were given, not very much of it, and Jesus lifted it to God and in partnership with God, the creator and controller of all things, he blessed the bread and the fish, and then Jesus gave the fish to the disciples and they fed the people, 5,000 of them. So this just happened. And as soon as it was finished, this is what Jesus did. We're gonna pick up the story in Matthew 14, verses 22 through 32. And while I read, you know, we read these stories all the time, right? We read, oh, I know that story. And you, you're gonna to try to, some of you are gonna to try to block me out right now. So <laughs> wake up. I'm telling you, God wants us to walk slowly through this passage. So I want you to feel it, think it, pay attention to where is Jesus? Where are the disciples? What's being said? So let's, let's get into it. In verse 22, immediately after feeding the 5,000, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. So after he dismissed the crowd, then he went up to a mountainside by himself to pray. And later that night, he was there alone. And the boat full of his disciples was already a considerable distance from the land. And he could see from a distance, they were buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, okay, time out. At nighttime, he went to pray. And shortly before dawn, did you catch that? He went out to them walking on the lake. On the lake. 
And when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. They apparently did not expect to see Jesus, certainly not walking on the water. Verse 27, but Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Very simply, Jesus said, come. And then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when, G when he saw, this is Peter, when he saw the wind, he was terrified. He was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus reached out his hand, and he caught him. You of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, then the wind died down. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? They get in the boat, then the winds die down. And those who were in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. What a passage. What a story. What an encounter. And I'm going to unpack this passage to us to see what the Lord has to say to us about stress. Now, the first thing I want you to note, and this is what I noticed, that the Lord said to them, go ahead of me. That means Jesus actually sent his disciples away from where he was physically into the, the sea, which it actually was the Sea of Galilee, and it's known for storms. So if you're thinking what I'm thinking, the disciples have been with Jesus, walking with him. But he's saying, I want you to go ahead of me into this place. Now, I got to stop and tell you a quick story. My family and I, we went on vacation this summer to the Boundary Waters. Anybody been to the Boundary Waters before? Boundary Waters is basically waters way up at the boundary of US and Canada. So we, the four of us, my husband Rob and I, and Sophia and Max, we got ourselves together, we drove up that way, we get out to the outfitters and they give us everything we need, two canoes, and I looked ahead, I was wise, I looked ahead and I saw that it was gonna rain. So I packed two rain suits for me and Sophia, because the boys were like, eh, we're guys. We don't need rain suits, we're men. <laughs> and they got wet. <laughs> And we ladies were, you know, hanging out dry, well, for the most part. But anyways, we get to the outfitter, and they show us on the map, you just go right up here, just a little bit, and if you go over here, there's a beautiful island, you'll pass lots of islands on the way, and so we are like, okay, two and a half hours, I'm thinking, sunshine. I'm thinking casting the fishing line, catching some fish on the way, a little bit of rain, it'll be okay. We'll just work our way towards the island. We weren't going to be stopped by any rain. Well, we get in the canoe. People, when I say the wind was against us, it was against us. The water was going against us. And we, it was me and Max in the, in the canoe and uh, Rob and Sophia. And we get in the canoe. And I'm not even exaggerating. We were like this, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. I mean, we were as, I mean, that fast, as fast as I learned to flip that handle really fast because the moment we stopped rowing, we were carried away. And we were determined that we were going to get to this beautiful little island and have a great time. We had family vacation, and I'll tell you, I, one of my most impressive things from this summer is that my, the four of us and the family who went on this trip we were all in it together. We didn't even complain. We were like, let's go. It's on like Donkey Kongs, we would say in our house. We just went for it. Nothing stopped us. And as I read this passage with the disciples, my guess is they probably had a little bit more ferocious water than we felt, and maybe they had a little more wind against them. Nevertheless, they were struggling to get across to the other side where Jesus had told them to go. And I wonder how many of us would be like, ah, this is too hard, and just stop. But they did not. I don't read anywhere in this passage that the disciples stopped. 
under the winds and the waves that were oppressing them. They continued, they pressed on in obedience regardless of what was going on. And you know what is also interesting to me? Um, my, uh, so when I'm reading this passage, the disciples did not pull back, they kept going in obedience. And you know, think about it, the disciples had been walking with Jesus now for probably a good almost three years. And at this point, Jesus had been peppering them with little statements of one day I won't be with you. Do you think it's possible, I like to wonder, do you think it's possible that Jesus sent them ahead so that they would learn to walk by faith and not by sight? I wonder if that is what is going on in this passage. John 16, 32 and 33 says, a time is coming, Jesus' words, to his disciples. A time is coming, and in fact has come, when you will be scattered, each to your own home. You will leave me alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. And here's verse 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Because in this world you will have stress. You will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. At what point does Jesus need them, need them to know that with all their being, even if he's not with them? I believe he's preparing them to be able to walk without him being physically felt or seen. And if Jesus did that with his disciples, do you think that maybe that is the way that the Lord works with us? that he sometimes gives us moments where we are said to go and make disciples, we know that, go and make disciples. He knew it was gonna be tough, and they had to continually move forward in obedience, knowing that it says in Mark 16 and Matthew 28, go and make disciples and I will be with you always, even to the ends of the earth. Even when you don't feel or see him, he is there. And here's the cool thing. Though they could not see Jesus, did you catch what I caught? That though they could not see him, he could see them. And he never took his eyes off of them. Know that when you are in your most treacherous times, you may not be able to see Jesus, but come on, somebody give me an amen. He never leaves us. He never loses sight of you. He knows what you're going through. And I want you to cling on to that today. The word says that he is never taking his eyes off of you. Hebrews 7, 24 and 25 says that Jesus lives forever. He has a permanent priesthood, which basically is saying he is a forever intercessor for you and I, always interceding for us. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives as an intercessor for them meaning he is always praying for us, always there. Now the Lord sent them ahead of him because he knew that they had what it took and he knew that he was watching over their assignment. Now Jesus said to them right after this in verse 27, oh I'm sorry, verse 25, right when he knew that they needed him, he showed up. He showed up in the middle of their stressful situation. He knew what they needed, and he knows what you need. Hear that. He sees you, and he will show up when he believes it's time to show up. And you may not expect him, like they said, they, they, didn't, they didn't expect him to show up on the water. They didn't expect to show up the way that he did, but he showed up. And I want to challenge you that when you need him, if you look around, you will see him. You will see him, he is not far. The word says, I never leave you nor forsake you. He says that I am with you always to the end. And here's what he said, listen to verse 27. Highlight it, mark it, this is a message for us today. Jesus immediately said to them, in their fear and in their stress, take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. He's saying to them, here's my credentials. Boom, drop the mic. I'm here. But not only did he give the credentials of I am with you, but he says, I'm telling you, because of who I am and because I'm here, you have the authority to exchange fear for courage. You can exchange fear for courage, and it is a decision that we get to make based on the fact that we know who is in our stress with us. 
Jesus. Let me give you a couple of passages. You need to write these down because I'm going to fly through them, but I feel like you have to have them. Because if you don't know the great I am who shows up in the middle of your mess, you may not recognize him. Let me tell you who he is. Psalm 46, 1 and 2 says that God is our refuge and our strength an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Psalm 55 verse 22, as well as in 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast your cares on the Lord. He will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. Isaiah 41 verse 10 says, do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed. I am your God. Know who is in the storm with you. The great I am is in the middle of your storm. He says, I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. In Psalm 43, oh, when you're feeling overwhelmed, I've been there before. When your heart and your mind feels downcast, here's the scripture. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Put your hope in God. Put your hope in God. I will yet praise him, my God and my Savior. Come on, we can praise him, our God and our Savior, right in the middle of our circumstances. Know that he, yes, give him a praise. He never takes his eyes off of you. Receive that. That's your word. That is a word for you today. So I want to just give you a quick strategy that I saw The first strategy about approaching stress is assess the stress. When Jesus showed up, he gave the credentials of who he was in the middle of it all, which tells me that I have to stop and look and see where is Jesus, who is he versus what I'm looking at. I need to actually think about what I'm thinking. Have you ever done that before? You kind of stop and you're like, hmm, I'm all up in my feels. I wonder why. Like, Holy Spirit, will you just help me right now? I'm feeling a certain way. Where is that coming from? And you ever like, kinda, I just kind of imagine like, I'm just sitting on the couch, me and Jesus. We're just, hey, this is what I'm feeling right now. What do you think? And just let him talk to you. Ah, this is where you felt this way before. Ah, and he begins to speak to you. And then what if you say, hey, um, while we're talking, why don't you look at all this stuff that I put out on the table? I'm thinking of this. This is all the stuff that I'm thinking about. This is my life circumstance. The storm's here. The wind's against us. I don't know what to do. And you and Jesus begin to talk about what you're looking at together. And be bold enough to say, Jesus, what do you see? Because if he never leaves us, that means he sees what we see. So I can ask him, what do you see? I want to have your perspective on this. And he can do that for you. Talk to him. Assess the mess of the stress and know that he is there. What's going on? Ask him. Matthew 25, verses you know, 25 through 33. I'm not going to read the whole passage, but this is a passage where... The, there's a word that's given to people who are worried about what they're going to wear, worried about what they're going to eat, worried about where they're going to live. And he's basically saying to them, the, the Lord takes care of the birds in the air. They don't have to worry about what they have. And you are dressed even greater than one of these creations of God. And if I, it says, he, I'm just going to read this piece, that if God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow, how much more will he clothe you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the non-believers run to all these things first to have their needs met. But he's saying to us, inventory your mess and the stress He says, I am with you. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Kind of like the disciples, just keep on going. Just keep on moving. And that's what we can do as well when we are facing circumstances that are so difficult. We can assess all of what is in front of us, ask the Lord to show us, and then keep on moving forward. And you know, I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm too emotional to make a decision. Anybody been there? You're like, I'm, I'm too, I'm too panic stricken right now, or I'm too hurt. I don't know where to go right now. And this is where we've been talking about getting in a group of believers. 
Because if you are frozen, you can say to someone who you know follows Jesus and you can trust their voice to say, hey, speak to me. What does the word say? What do those scriptures say? What are you seeing? Help me and pull me along. It's so important that we can know that we are not alone. Jesus is with us, but he also has, has us to step back, catch our breath, calm ourselves down. Because if we don't calm our thoughts down, sometimes the thoughts become bigger than our reality. And so we've got to align ourselves with God's word. Got to do that. Now, I want to tell you, when we keep working down this passage, look at verse 28. It's so awesome to me. When I began to dig into this passage, I was overwhelmed with the awe of what Peter did. When Jesus said, it is I, change courage, or yeah, change your fear for courage, Peter's like, okay, I'm taking you up on that word right away. And he literally stepped out into a courage moment. And he said, bid me to come to you, call me to you. And he does. Here's the thing. Jesus sends us out because he knows that we have within us what we need. He shows up at the right time, but sometimes we don't see him and so we need to walk in courage. And that's what Peter did. Peter said, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come on. Then Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. Now, we know that God is the God of all creation. He's the God of the sun. He makes it stand still or rise. We know that he is the God who created the heavens and the earth. But when we know that and act in courage, let's see what happens. Peter literally goes, okay, I've been walking with Jesus. I've been seeing him. I've been partnering with him in ministry, but I want to see for myself the supernatural. I no longer want to be a spectator or just a partner in ministry. I need ministry myself. And he steps out and here, I just, man, it's awesome. Peter, when he stepped out, he pressed beyond rationalization and intellect. Now, intellect is fantastic. I love to study. Actually, I love to study. But sometimes intellect sets boundaries that God wants to push beyond. So be sure that when you're assessing the situation, you don't forget that God is a God of even the impossibilities. And so he's calling us to step out. And when Peter pressed beyond what was naturally, physically possible, he stepped out of the boat and he stepped into the faith realm, I believe. He stepped into a faith realm where the physical and the supernatural met when his foot hit the water. God of all creation made it that his foot would not sink. God did that. By faith in Jesus, Peter stepped out and he knew that God in that moment was taking a moment that was impossible and making it possible, taking a supernatural and matching natural. Peter's experience reveals the truth that I can expect God to do the impossible and I can participate in it as well. So here's a homework assignment for you. We're stopping right here for a moment. Get out your phone, get out your piece of paper. I want you to write down something absolutely miraculous. I want to see God do this. And I want you to write it down. I want you to take a note of it and I want you to put it somewhere important so that you can see, I'm asking God to, you fill in the blank, bring $60,000. I'm asking him to do it. I'm asking him to make this day go longer than it, needs, than it actually is. Ask him to do the miraculous. I want you to jot it down because if he can do it for Peter, he can do it for you and I. When I cannot see a way through in the natural, I know God who is bigger than the natural. I know a God who's moving within the natural. And I know a God who is among the natural to reveal a way where there seems to be no way. But I know this, and you know this, stress is inescapable. So, here's the other lesson I want us to take away from this passage. Know when to ask for help. I mean, Peter stepped out in faith and courage but then he saw what was around him. And I tell you, preachers, good preachers have given Peter a really hard time. And that's not where I want to go. But I know that when Peter saw the wind and the waves, he realized his limitations in the midst of the circumstances around him. And he cried out for help. Think about it. Jesus has been walking with his disciples, training them to think the way that he wants them to think. Like before they, were fish, before they were followers of Jesus, they were fishermen. 
right? They didn't follow the ways of Jesus. They were trained in the ways of culture and they were naturally going to revert in the stressful situations. They're gonna naturally revert to what they've always done before. But Jesus is saying, hey, I wanna interrupt this and I wanna give you a different way. And I know that when we are sinking and overwhelmed, our society pushes, our society pressures us to do a certain way or respond to stress a certain way. Hey, just go shopping, that'll make you feel better. You wanna go get a coffee? Let's just go and get a coffee. That'll make you feel better. Hey, let's just go and let's just escape, on, let's just watch a movie. We're just gonna sit on the screen all day long and just scroll, I, I don't know. And again, I'm not saying that all these things are wrong. We all need to shop, right? I don't know why I just said that, I hate shopping. <laughs> Anyways, but there's nothing wrong with shopping. The point is, Jesus is trying to train them that when you realize your limitations, instead of running to what you used to do before you were a follower, run to me. Change the way that you're thinking. Reach out your hand to me rather than a bottle. Reach out your hand to me rather than something that has got you clinging, like clinging to you. And it has control of you. He's saying, put your hand out and I will lift you up when you are overwhelmed. Amen. Hey, that's an amen moment. Yes. We may be tempted to look at how society handles stress. But when the pressure comes and stress is building, where do you look? Right. Ask yourself, seriously, where do you go first? And if your first response is not to prayer or to godly people, then I'm just asking you to ask the Holy Spirit to show you how to shift that, that we are asking for prayer from him and direction from him first. What is the first thing that you do? And by the way, in case you missed it, Tonight is pray first. And I am asking that if you want to come and have prayer over the things that are overwhelming you, you're gonna to come tonight and we're gonna pray you through that. And we're not just gonna pray, pray through the stress, but we're also going to um, pray for our missionaries who are under huge uh, opposition overseas, here, near, and far. And we wanna pray that God will sustain them as well. So that was a little plug for tonight. Hopefully you can come. I'm gonna leave you with a couple of scriptures. I know, I'm just giving it to you. But John 14, 27 says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. First John 4, verses four and five. The disciples are actually walking, they're going to different places where the gospel has been preached and some people are actually preaching a gospel that's tainted by things that are not of God. And so he's challenging them to go back to the actual scriptures and do not be persuaded by influences of the world. So here's the scripture. It says, you, dear children, are from God and have overcome them, the ones who are falsely guiding them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world. Isn't that profound? Right here in the scripture. If you're finding comfort in people who are not God followers, guess what they're going to give you? They're going to give you non-God following advice. So be careful that you're listening to voices that are listening to the one and only God, the Father. And then Romans 12, one and two, I think I quote this scripture about every time I preach, but I cannot help it. It's a scripture that says, when you present your bodies as a living sacrifice to God, holy and pleasing act of worship and let your mind be transformed into thinking the way that he wants you to think, then you will be able to, and I'm gonna read it, you will, you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. But wait, I'm in the middle of a storm, I can't even think you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. But they're telling me to do this, you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You will know God's will in the middle of the storm. When you get a diagnosis, you say, no. I know God's will. I know what he has said to me in his word, and I'm gonna proclaim it, and I'm gonna put my foot down where it seems impossible, and I'm gonna believe that God, Father, creator of all, will make a way where it is impossible. I will know God's will and I will be at peace when it doesn't seem like I should have peace. People around you really matter. 
You gotta stay in line with God's word and you gotta stay in worship. Did you know that when you worship and pray, it takes the focus off of you and onto him? And the more you spend time in worship and focusing on him, the more you're gonna know his character. And therefore, you're gonna know how to navigate when you are panicked or you are overwhelmed or you can't get your footing. He is gonna give you that. He is gonna give you that. And I just have to tell you, uh, Psalm 119, 143, I'm just packing it in. Are you writing it down? Come on, these are quotable scriptures to you. Trouble and distress have come upon me, but your scripture gives me delight. Get in his word. His word is living and active, and it will help you. I do know this too. Sometimes we have borrowed trouble. Did I just say that? I was praying one day with some intercessors at my house, and um, we were praying, and we were just interceding, and, and, the, and the one woman, she just stopped, and she said, you know what, we need to pray that the Lord would give wisdom to his people, because I think, as we were praying through something, that we bring on unnecessary spiritual warfare by coming into agreement with voices that are not of God. And so I just feel like as I'm talking about navigating the storm, like the disciples did, knowing that Jesus is there, sometimes we have to actually stop and begin to say, am I bringing more on me than necessary? And just ask the Lord to show you what needs to be pared back or what needs to be, you know, just calm down on this thing. And it might be a good thing, but it might not be the right time. I'm gonna read you a couple more scriptures. My heart, O oh God, is not proud. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things that are too wonderful for me. Have you ever thought that maybe some things you're stressing over are never gonna be understood this side of heaven? So why borrow that stress? Just let it be there and trust the Lord that he's gonna work it out. Hebrews, that was uh, Psalm 131, one and two. Hebrews 13, five says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Sometimes we can eliminate a few stressors in our life just by where we give our attention. But here's what I know. Stress is normal. Stress is normal. I went to El Salvador uh, quite a few years back and I was standing on the edge of the ocean. And while I was standing there, I could see my toes in the water and I was on the beach and the water was just, you know, if you've ever been on the ocean, the water goes out and the water comes back in. And so I was standing there and all of a sudden the water came back in. And when the water came back in, literally I was like, I was just like trying to keep my footing. I could not keep my footing. But then as soon as the water went back out, I was like, dude, I can see my feet. But a moment ago, I could barely stand up. And the Lord whispered to me, Seasons of feeling overwhelmed are not uncommon. They're a part of life. And so instead of feeling panicked by the winds and the waves, he was saying to me, be still, get your footing. When stress comes, you'll be ready. And I thought how appropriate of a visual for us sometimes. And I think, to be honest, I have to confess, for years I began to, I would sometimes get overwhelmed because I was feeling pressure. And my counselor a couple of years back said, I think you need to understand that as soon, the sooner you can normalize stress in your life, the less it'll rock you. Right. Right. So I give you that as a free gift. <laughs> that you're never gonna not have stress or never going to not have opposition in your life. We live in a world that's broken. Right. But if you can normalize that Jesus is with you and you're gonna be okay, then you're not rocked by it. Get your footing in your worship and then know that you're ready for the next time the opposition comes. Amen. Amen. I felt compelled to do something in closing today. We're gonna watch a clip from The Chosen. It's a small piece. And my buddy, Pastor Ryan, he helped me edit it. And for those of you who are watching online, I'm very sorry, but you're gonna to have to watch with no audio, but you can find this clip on YouTube if you'd like to watch it. But I want you to watch this clip after you've heard me talk about the story and you've heard me compel you to, to look and to see where Jesus is, I want you to watch this clip and I want you to figure out what is my response to today's message? Where am I in the story? So go ahead and watch this clip. I've been there before. I've been there before. 
and maybe you are at the beginning of your storm. Maybe you've walked with Jesus and you know he is great and he is mighty, but the storm is overwhelming you. And you feel like you don't know how you're going to make the next move. Maybe you are like Peter. I stepped out in faith. I did what you said. And you still feel like you're drowning. He's calling you today to affirm within you that he is with you. He sees you. If it's difficult, if you trust him, then you can know that without a doubt, he's doing something in the middle of the storm. I'd like you to close your eyes because I want to ask you some questions. I want you to think about what I'm saying without the concern about what other people are doing. So just, just for a moment, just begin to close your eyes so you can really think. So many times we try to save ourselves when we're drowning. But in reality, if you think about that statement, if you're drowning, you cannot save yourself. Jesus is here today and he's among you. He's among this place. And I believe that there are people in this room who perhaps are going through the motion who are showing up, who are just out of kindness coming to church and, and you're here today. But today God is saying, I want you to know that you need a savior. You may not be drowning at this very moment, but the Bible states that we feel a void and struggle with a sense of purpose without having a relationship with him. And we will begin to look everywhere for help in life, but eventually, we still come up short, but Jesus is here. And he's saying, I want to rescue you. And I want to give you a chance to turn your eyes and your heart to the one who is in control of it all. We believe that God so loved you that he sent Jesus to earth to show us how to live for him in stress. And then Jesus died and he rose to show us that he overcomes even not just sin, but life itself. And he did this for you and for me. And when I couldn't figure out how to find peace, he showed up and he asked me to take his hand. And I wanna give us an opportunity today who have never reached our hand out. I want to give you a chance to lift your hand and to show me that you need Jesus to save you. And you want to accept him into your life as the one who will fulfill you and satisfy you.